good morning and uh, welcome for joining us. Thank you on this very wet day on the Australian East Coast at least. Uh, we're excited to be here and also to acknowledge International Women's Day, uh, a great day in the calendar. So uh, thank you for making some time to be with us. Let's uh, just quickly look at some housekeeping. So as you know, we use Zoom to record our webinars and replays are always available through our blog post, which will be up within sort of seven or so days of the user group each month. Um, now we do use the Q&A and we encourage you to use the Q&A throughout the course of the meeting. We've got the team assisting with that. So please just make sure you're aware that everything you ask through Q&A is visible to all webinar attendees. If you do want to ask something privately though, you can use the chat function to do that and address that to one of the panelists. Uh, and we're more than happy to, to help with that. So my name is Derek Bell, the Director of Customer Success and Marketing here at Marketing Cube. Coming to you live from the office today for a change, and all I'm um, at the home office, but uh, that's crowded at the moment. So uh, I'm here at the office today, so it's good to be here. We've got Jason O'Donnell on the line as well, and Jason's going to help with Q&A. So uh, make sure you keep him busy uh, with loads of questions. As we said, it would be remiss uh, today to not acknowledge the, the women that we work with and the women in our lives and uh, certainly acknowledge International Women's Day today. So hopefully you've got something happening in the office. Uh, there seem to be lots of different things happening in various corporate environments. So uh, it's great to see. So uh, thank you again and, and always happy to acknowledge the, the great women that we work with at Marketing Cube uh, here within the business and uh, with our customers as well. So thank you and I hope you have a wonderful day. Hopefully you can stay dry is probably the main priority today. Okay, so let's have a look at the agenda for today. So we're going to go get down to the basics, I suppose. First of all, is if we're going to actually work with the data that matters following on from last month, we need to have confidence in that data. So we're going to show you a few ways that you can potentially enhance that level of confidence. But we'll also look at ways to check the quality of the data, an important part in understanding, I suppose, how we can have confidence in that data. So we'll look at ways to check the quality of that data. Then the key point today is moving beyond personalization into hyper-personalization. And of course, that's a challenge if points one and two aren't necessarily in order. Uh, we'll do a quick recap on the 22A release from February and uh, just revisit a couple of those key points for you. So just a re quick recap from last month. So last month, our focus was very much on the data that matters. And the data that matters will differ for every organization. And we looked at that in a range of different ways. So we talked about the notion of, well, if I'm having to develop marketing qualified leads to hand over to a sales organization, whether that be in a, a law firm, whether that be in a university environment, whether that be in the financial sector, wherever it might be, that passing of a lead to a sales organization typically needs to have a, a minimum number or minimum set of data points. It could be first name, last name. Some have to have a mobile phone number, for example. So that helps us to quickly identify the data that matters. And then we can go beyond that um, and look at other information as well. So how did we do that? So last month, we explored that in a bit of detail by looking at the form design editor. And so we took a bit of a dive into the form and understanding the basics of how the form works, you know, capturing that information um, and making sure that we're not just using the same form over and over again. Because if we do that, we're really missing opportunities to capture that data that actually matters and that is going to make a difference to what we're doing. From there, we then talked about advanced tips for smarter form use. And we talked about the processing steps of forms and looking at whether we could take data and put them into programs or do we add people to other campaigns or do we move those people from Eloqua into the CRM platform, for instance, using again, processing steps in order to do that. So we took a bit of a deep dive. Replays are available on the blog post. So I encourage you to go back uh, if you missed last month. So, First thing I wanted to do was sort of get a bit of a pulse check on the qual or the confidence level that you have with your data today. I'll leave that on the screen and sort of jump into the next point and uh, we'll come back when I see that's see that's finished. All right, so let's get down to the basics. So my my visual here was thinking that it's a little bit cli like climbing steps, right? We just do one step at a time uh, and and keep working at processes that will help us 
uh, develop greater confidence in the data that we have. So let's dive in and have a closer look. So I was trying to think through, you know, what are the basics of better data management? And this is really now working with the data that matters, which is our topic today. And uh, I kind of immediately dove straight into, you know, forms and scrubbing data, et cetera, but I kind of took a step back for a minute. And that is that we need to take an enterprise wide view uh, of our data model and what that looks like and not think about our data in a silo. So it's easy for us to focus just on what Eloq was doing, but there's so much more typically to, to our data than what's happening in Eloqua. And in many cases, Eloq was not even the source of truth for data. It could be the CRM, it could be other areas. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Even if you're a small organization, perhaps like Marketing Cube, or maybe you're just a small team of two or three marketers and, uh, and maybe you're connected to a CRM, okay? And so that enterprise-wide view for you would be those two platforms. So it's about taking a more holistic view. So that would be the first step. Second step is to know the source of your data, know where the source of truth is, or if you're not sure, know how to determine that source uh, of your data. So um, that can come down to, is it the basic form on the website, for instance, where people can sign up to the blog, having clear understanding where that's coming from into the Eloqua, which form is being used, what are the processing steps that are in place? You know, are we definitely taking all of those blog subscribers from the website? into the Eloqua form and are we passing them directly into the CRM? Having the ability to know that is critical uh, to better data management. And then three is also understanding the impact of any corrections or edits that you might make to your data. In some cases, especially where there's a CRM involved, you may spend a lot of time scrubbing and cleaning data and do that directly within Eloqua. But if you're not clear on how the integration takes place, all of your hard work could be erased when the next integration kicks in and everything is simply restored from the CRM. So that's what I mean by having to understand the source of your data with point number two. So we need to know where the scrubbing and the cleaning needs to take place in order to get the right result that you want. And especially with the time, that, you know, it's very likely that you'll be investing uh, in that process. Okay, so using Eloqua to check data quality, <laughs> the idea of the wall of police here was that uh, you know, maybe we need like a, a wall somewhere, like a, a process, a, a group of people uh, to check that data before it comes in. And Eloqua is the way you do that checking, whether it's programs, whether it's form processing steps, that can be a range of ways that you in fact uh, can check the quality of your data. So let's have a look at first of all, understanding a little bit of an ecosystem of what our integration might look like and, and where various pieces are. So for many of you on the call today, you're going to have Eloqua, obviously, <laughs> and then you're going to have a CRM. And for you, that CRM might be Oracle Sales Cloud, it might be Salesforce, uh, it could be NetSuite, it could be a whole range of different platforms. But um, you know, if you're, um, I've got some other examples here, I think, of different systems that may in fact plug into the back end of your CRM. So you might have an ERP. If you're a large you know, enterprise resource type of organization, you'll have an ERP. Uh, you might, if you're a legal firm, you might have a matter management system. Most of you will have a billing system. That could be the ERP, of course, or it might be a different billing system. Universities will have student management. Maybe if you're a, a not-for-profit type of organization, you might have a membership management platform. All of these different platforms will plug into the CRM, or in fact, some of those types of characteristics may be performed by your CRM. But either way, all of that data flows from the CRM into Eloqua, and it can flow both ways, or it may in fact only flow in one direction. Some information goes directly to Eloqua, some only goes from Eloqua to the CRM and everyone's integration is a little bit different, but we need to understand this ecosystem. But there's other ways data can come into your systems and that is directly into Eloqua. And that can be for a range of ways. It could be through your website. You might have secure websites that people have to log into if you're a retail type of business with an online presence where people can purchase and, and buy things online, then you probably have a secure website where they log in and, and so on and so forth. So that information can flow into Eloqua Social. If you're doing uh, campaigns where you're advertising on LinkedIn or even Facebook, presenting people with forms, for example, well, that information is also going to flow into Eloqua. And then of course, maybe channel partners, maybe 
different types of partners or organizations that you deal with or work with might also be another way that this information will actually flow into Eloqua. And then, of course, from Eloqua, where does it go from there? Does it stay? In some cases, it may well just stay in Eloqua, but it could go to the CRM as well. So there's a few things to consider and, and kind of factor in there. Okay, let's go back to that poll and get a bit of a feel for the results. All right, so it feels like most of us are kind of right in the middle. So nearly 74% are saying their confidence levels are at a medium level, which is good. That's good. We have a, a few brave souls who are saying they have high confidence, which is cool. And a few at the other end uh, that have low confidence. So, okay. Okay. That helps me position a little bit the rest of the, the session today. So thank you for responding to that. So let's look at Eloqua in a bit more detail and typically ways that Eloqua gets that data or receives that data. And we talked last month in quite a bit of detail about the form and how the form can do that. So the form, if it's simply the same form that we use over and over again, or we just ask the same questions over and over again, we're not going to be in a position to really do much with the data we get because it's going to be sort of ho-hum along the way, right? In this particular example, this is the, the form that you all filled in to register for today's session, and that appeared on a landing page like so. And so that form, like many other forms, uh, did a whole range of different things. And everybody would have seen a slightly different view of that form because we use the progressive profiling to hide certain fields if we already knew the answers to those fields, et cetera. The ability to do that each month for us means that we're constantly adding different types of data points to a more highly engaged segment of our database. So what do you do with the people who are not uh, overly engaged? So that probably is another topic for another user group uh, around sort of re-engagement type of campaigns and, and looking to cleanse data, I suppose. But let's look uh, and take a, a thinking person's approach. Okay, so steps that most eloquent users have control over. These are things that you can impact and things that you can do to make a, a or have a better experience with the quality of the data that you need. So the fundamental thing is poor data in is poor data out. That's, that's the most obvious. So whether it's the CRM platform, people are putting data in and coming into Eloqua, if they're not thinking about it, if they're lazy, whatever the case may be, then poor data in is poor data out. If you're uploading Excel spreadsheets, which we know we, you know, we try and avoid where possible, but in some cases it just has to be done and that's okay too. We need to really think about the quality of that data and look over that data and take time to scrub and cleanse it while it's in Excel before you even get it into Eloqua. And think about having a minimum level of fields that are going to make the process easier for you once it gets into Eloqua. So simply uploading a spreadsheet with email addresses is probably like the least, most productive thing you could do. Uh, adding first name and last name is clearly a winner. Uh, if you've got some geographical information, are they at least in Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia? You know, where are these people? At least, you know, let's get some geography in there. That's going to help from a segmentation point of view. And then you want to think about lead source information as well. You know, where did this Excel spreadsheet come from? Are they net new additions? Are these people you've not put in the platform before? If that's the case, well, let's make sure we put some lead source information in there. So in 12 months time, we know where Jenny Smith came from. She wasn't just randomly loaded in, uh, into, the, into the platform. Something to avoid from a form point of view would be free text fields. So let's think about free text fields where we need them, which clearly is first name, last name, company name, job title. You know, beyond that, um, we probably should be avoiding free text fields as much as possible. Uh, they typically are useless to you from a segmentation point of view. Um, it's very rare that you're going to do a, a, you know, cut a segment on every Karen in the database. That typically is not something you're going to do. So that's not a problem. But free text is just difficult to do anything with besides the obvious ones of first name, last name, company, and, and perhaps job title. But states and countries and all those sorts of things should be single select pick lists. It gives you much better quality data and is going to enable you to be far more productive from a segmentation point of view and also from a personalization point of view uh, as well. 
So that brings me to the importance of pick lists. Um, we need to make sure the pick lists are clean and they're accurate. And what do I mean by that? So pick lists, as you know, can be created in two different areas within Eloqua. You, they're all, it's just one, one list of pick lists, but you can come at it from two different ways. You may create a pick list directly within the form itself, uh, or you may go into the back end of Eloqua under settings and, and do it that way. That's typically how I choose to do it. So this is the pick list area of Eloqua. And when I talk about clean, this is what I mean about option value and option name, those two things that are highlighted there. So in this example, I've chosen uh, the state abbreviations for the United States, and this will differ, differ for everybody. Let me give you an example, just a little bit of knowledge from my, I was going to say with my gray hair, but I don't have hair, but you know, if I had, it would be great. So I know that with Oracle, for example, so Oracle CRM platforms use let's see if I get this right now. They use a two letter acronym, I think. Yes, they use a two letter acronym for states and countries. And that's fairly common right across different Oracle products. If you move into a Salesforce platform though, they don't. Uh, they typically use Alabama is Alabama. These are just defaults that I'm talking about. Of course you can change anything. But the thing that you need to be aware of is if data is going here from Eloqua, from your pick list onto the Eloqua contact, and then integrating with a CRM platform, we need to make sure that the values are in line with the CRM platform. So that when this contact gets, or a contact gets into the CRM and person has said they're from Arizona, we can show them Arizona at the front, but in the back end, Eloqua sees it as AZ or AZ maybe would be the term. So that's what I mean by clean. And uh, that's a, an ongoing process and something that you just simply need to be aware of. In many cases, there'll be hopefully your Eloqua administrator who kind of owns these things for you um, and is giving you good, accurate pick lists to work from uh, and play with, but just something for you to be aware of in that process. Okay, so pick lists, clean and accurate. So a tip that I would give you is to never edit an existing pick list. When I initially put this slide together, I, I added to that, you know, the exception could be, and then I thought, you know what, no, there just are no exceptions. Um, it's just too dangerous to edit an existing pick list. If you need to create a pick list that is slightly different, um, you really should create your own pick list. If it's a big one, you can upload it as an Excel file. That can make it a little bit easier. Uh, you may need to get your administrator to help you do that if, it's, uh, if, it's, um, if you don't have access to the back end of Eloqua. But, um, but yeah, the golden rule typically is never edit an existing pick list because you don't know where that's being used uh, and you don't know the impact of your changes uh, in that process. The other one to help from a, a cleansing point of view is Eloqua programs. So Eloqua programs are an incredibly powerful way to do a lot of those sort of mundane tasks that sometimes you might want to try and use form processing steps to do and you kind of run into a little bit of a brick wall. So typically, if you do run into a little bit of a brick wall and you're like, well, I can't really work out how the form is going to do that, you could actually push them from the form processing step directly onto a program and use a program to do that. To give you an example, when people join the Eloqua user group, we stamp their contact with a join date. So we can tell them that they've been a member since whatever date. You may have seen that in some of our communications. But um, in that example, what I wanted to do was to make sure that we didn't override the field with a new date every time somebody uh, uh, subscribed or uh, registered each month for the user group. So, uh, so what we did is we've sent that information, sent everybody onto a program and the program is always running, it's always there. And essentially they come onto the program. First thing we do is ask the question, is the join date field currently blank? If it is blank, then we go off in a position and we stamp their contact with the date. If obviously it's populated, well then they just exit the program. And so you will all have gone through that program uh, in the last week or so since you registered. Um, if you're brand new today, this is your first user group, then you'll have a, a date applied. However, for those people who have been with us for many months or years, um, there's no date there. It's, it's, uh, it's left to be the original date format. So programs can become a really cool way to help improve the quality of your data. 
And in that particular example, the contact washing machine is also really helpful. Now you may have may be familiar with using the contact washing machine on the campaign canvas in some of your campaigns, but the contact washing machine is also available for use on programs. So the program canvas can also access the, the broad functionality of the contact washing machine to help scrub and clean data. It, we have some clients who have several programs running, which are kind of really like data washing exercises. So these programs run every day. They have a filter set on them or a criteria to come in. It can be little things like, for example, cleaning up states. In, in Australia, I've got an example here soon of New South Wales, NSW or N.S.W, for example. I'll, I'll come back to that when we get to that slide and show you that one. So, the point here, combining forms and programs. So let's jump in and I'll just quickly show you one of the programs that we use. So we have applied join date to new user group members. So here it is right here. So you can see it's pretty simple. It's not overly complex. So we have different forms that feed into this particular step that's referred to as a listener. So the, the sources, if I view the sources, will be different types of forms. So it's our global user group. And we're, we've literally just started this particular program. So we'll be retroactively going back to, excuse me, to old replays, et cetera, and adding those. So eventually what you'll see here is a really long list uh, a whole range of different forms that will all feed into this single program. And so then the first question simply is, is the join date blank, is, sorry, is the user group join date blank? And if it is blank, then we go off and we use a form submit to apply a date. Then here we have some other processes in the business that we play with there, for instance, yes or no. It's either populated, and if we still get a bit of a, an, an error message, I've got some steps here to help me manage that process. So if I have a look, let's uh, I haven't looked at this yet. We've only had it running a little while. We haven't got, no, I haven't got anyone going through it yet. So but, uh, that's because, yeah, because it hasn't been applied yet to the, uh, like the form for this month. So it's my little work in progress, my project at the moment. But, um, but that will then help us scrub that particular data and just keep it accurate because we want to use that data for more things in the future. And so the program will just be there in the back end and we'll be able to take care of that for us on an ongoing basis. So what I want, I want to try to do here is have a little bit of fun uh, with you, but um, try and think of, and we're trying to do this each month and, and we'll call it an Eloqua hack. It's not really a hack because there's, you can't really hack Eloqua, but it's it's just something, uh, an area of Eloqua that does some really cool stuff that you may not be aware of. And so what I wanted to do here is show you one really quick way to do some cleansing of data. Went through this process with a client which, uh, a couple of months ago, which kind of prompted me to, to show you this. So what we're doing here is we're looking under fields and views in the back end of Eloqua, and we're looking at a particular field. And so this particular field for us within our platform is in fact uh, retired. We don't use this anymore. So it's actually looking pretty clean, but you will notice it says state AU. Okay. And clearly Illinois, Texas, Georgia, Colorado, New York, etc., are not Australian states. Okay. But the key thing that we wanted to identify here was, you know, is there an opportunity to cleanse information? So the big challenge I find uh, sometimes, certainly within the Australian market, is something as simple as our abbreviations for states. So this has been a bugbear of mine. So that's why the data is looking pretty clean. But you might have people who, especially if there's a CRM involved, and one of the things that frustrates me with Salesforce, for example, is it's a free text field. You, you can't populate it. And there's a few of you on the line who probably know Salesforce better than I do, but I just wish that state field could be a single select pick list for better data quality. But people do all sorts of things, right? When they manually type it in, they might type in New South Wales, don't see too much of that, but we might see n.s s.w and then we might see nsw nsw being the most common way to abbreviate new south wales for example but the problem is if we end up with three different values um, that makes it much harder for our from us 
when we want to do segmentation, for example, or if we want to use it for dynamic content, uh, those sorts of things. So with, with dirty data, it becomes a little bit of a challenge. So let's jump in and I'll show you quickly how you can fix that. I found an example actually relating to country. Okay, so we go to settings and from settings, we go to fields and views. And again, whether or not you can access this part of Eloqua will depend on your access levels. Certainly your administrator, uh, get that word out for a moment, your administrator will be able to help with that. So I'm going to identify the, in this example, I want to show you country. And if from here, if we scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll see an option called field population details. And if I click on view, some information will come up. And so what I'm looking at here is you can see within our database that we have pretty good penetration of good quality data in relation to country. So as we sort of scroll down through there, we can see that's looking pretty good. So what is it I'm actually looking at? So what I'm looking at is Eloqua is telling me that within our instance of Marketing Cube, we have 7,000, I'll zoom in a bit there so you can see that. We have 7,282 contacts that have a field value within country and the value is Australia. And you see New Zealand, and you can see there are 516 that are in fact blank. So we have 516 contacts, which last time I checked is actually largely testing data, thank goodness. Um, so we've made a really concerted effort over the last couple of years to really emphasize this data on all of our forms. It's been a little bit of an objective from our point of view. And so that's what that's doing. Let me show you one that's not quite as clean, which is state or province. So if I come to state or province, Click on view. Okay, so now you can see we're breaking down. So now you understand what we're looking at is New South Wales, 3,300 people. As you start to scroll down though, some things will start to be like, well, hang on a minute. Um, Spain, as far as I'm aware, is not a state, it's a country. Same as Taiwan, or that one probably open for debate. Um, most of those, Hong Kong, Waikato, this is obviously pretty crappy data, state AU. So what we can do is we can either fix it right here. So for instance, <laughs> I'll get rid of this one. Okay, so what I can do is click on the little chevron here on the left. If I click on edit, you'll get a pop-up screen. And on the pop-up screen, it'll talk about the original value and the new value. So that's pretty bad. So what I'm gonna do is change it to New South Wales, which I know is incorrect, but it'll make it easier <laughs> for me to find later so I can correct it. So then I hit save, and when I hit save, I'm gonna get this message. And basically what this message is telling you is the action will set the value of this field for up to 50,000 contacts in that group. So you're gonna only clean 50,000 contacts at a time. Look, it's highly likely you'd probably need more than that, but if you do, you just need to do it in batches, that's all, etc. So I click on okay, and save and close. So state AU will disappear from there, it'll refresh. And somewhere in here, we'll find New South Wales. There it is. So now I've actually made that change. So that little ability to scrub and clean, we found with a client, we're going through a lead scoring uh, exercise. You might remember last month, we talked about the importance of quality data. And, um, and they found in their platform that across the states of Australia, the abbreviations were just extraordinary and so they actually have their instance of Eloqua in isolation it's not connected to a CRM platform and so they're able to make those changes here directly how do you find that information though because often what you really want to do is understand the root cause like how did I get a contact to have a state field of state dash au I mean clearly that's not a state so how did that happen so the easiest way to do that is to come over to your segment area. And so what I did, so here's one I prepared earlier. I found under a slightly different field, under state or province, a value of USA, which is clearly a country and not a state. So once you've done that, once you, you create your just compare contact fields is the easiest way to do it. You can then come in here and click on view contacts. And so I can come in here and now I can see, and I can say, so with these two particular contacts, that's clearly kind of out of whack for some reason. So 
the best thing to do then, trying to get to the root cause, trying to find and isolate what the problem is, is to grab the email address of those individuals and then go and have a look at the actual contact itself. So from the contact point of view, you can find out when that contact was created. You can look at form behavior over the last two years, for example, and try and isolate and determine where the cause is and where the bad data is in fact coming from. So look, that may sound like a few extra steps, but if the goal is cleansing data, then we definitely want to make sure we get to the root cause, not just try and do a little bit of a Band-Aid uh, over it for what we need. Because chances are, if you're integrated to Eloqua, I can go to these contacts, I can make the changes, but within half an hour or even 15 minutes, the integration will kick in. And for us, like many of you, Eloqua, uh, sorry, CRM is the source of truth. And so the CRM will come in and it will simply restore the data that you see on the screen in front of you. So it's about understanding where the source of truth is to my point earlier. So that's a little bit of a hack. So hopefully that uh, is something that might prove helpful for you uh, as you look at cleansing some data. So moving beyond personalization and into hyper-personalization, of course, all of that data has to be clean and scrubbed and, and ready in order for you to do that. But I think for many people, it can be a mix of things, but the key thing from a hyper-personalization point of view is making sure that the things that you want to look at relate to the people you're targeting in the campaign. And that can be done in a, a range of ways. So that could be expressed or implied interest. So people could have expressly told you that they're interested in XYZ travel destination, XYZ course of study. Maybe they're looking for assistance uh, with financial planning, retirement type exercises, all those sorts of things. So maybe they've expressly told you that. However, you can also, from a hyper-personalization point of view, look at implied interest. And so implied interest could be, let's take a university example. So they've told you they want to study engineering, but you're able to tell from a segmentation point of view, they've also looked over a range of business courses as well. So from a hyper-personalization point of view, is there an ability to present a primary message around their course in engineering and then potentially additional information around business because you can see through segmentation and you would use dynamic content uh, to present that sort of information. So profile data is another common way to hyper-personalize. So when I say profile data, just think about the contact. When you look at the, excuse me, look at the eloquent contact, it's their first name, it's their last name, it's their job title, it's geographical points, you know, which city they're in, which state, et cetera. Um, any of the information you have stored on the Eloqua contact typically could be inferred to be sort of profile data. Now, of course, personas is another really nice way to help you hyper-personalize and tailor the messaging that you've got. And so if you've got personas in play, that can be another nice way to group like behavior and then using things like dynamic content uh, and field mergers to deliver a more personalized experience to people. But as I thought through all of these points, I was reminded of a comment from a, a friend of mine who had an ad agency many, many years ago. And uh, hyper-personalization, clearly not a term that person used in the 1980s, but hyper-personalization without the right data is like trying to wink at someone in the dark. It's just not effective. Okay, we must have that data in place. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it certainly needs to be a little bit better than just simply saying dear first name in our campaigns. So here's an, a suggested approach, something for you to think about. How can I take this concept of hyper-personalization and apply it to what I'm doing today? So it's a little bit like a chicken and an egg scenario, which comes first? Do I have to have the right data or do I have to have the right people? Which one is it? I'd suggest, you know, do your building process, you know, do the build of your audience. And it could be, and just group those people, however you do it today. Maybe it's because they're subscribers they subscribe to a particular newsletter, for example, that could be one particular point. It could be that they all have a particular type of product or service from your organization or expressed interest in a particular course of study or financial planning strategy or something like that, some common type of data. And once you get that together, you've got your segment, take some time to actually look at the audience. So go into the segment, view the contacts and actually look at the data. Okay. 
So where can you start? And so newsletters, I think, is a great place to start because most of us are doing newsletters and chances are we're maybe producing sort of one newsletter and it just kind of goes to everybody. But if we have a look at the data and we look at the people that make up the audience or the segment for that particular newsletter, you may quickly identify that there are some opportunities to do a little bit of uh, a little bit better personalization. And we can hopefully move beyond just the first name. So what's the primary goal of the newsletter? Why does it go out every month? What's its objective? If we're in real estate, is it to share with people available properties? If, it, uh, if we're a financial servicing firm, is it tips and ideas from financial planners and their view of the market and what's happening in the market? If we're a law firm, is it about trying to communicate to people various levels of expertise that you have within different parts of the practice, for example. There can be a whole range of different goals, but we need to understand what the goal is so then we can personalize uh, to help support the goal. So that means you need to know your audience and that means you have to look at the data. You can't just simply look at the number and go, okay, we've got four and a half thousand subscribers, fantastic. That's four and a half thousand unique individuals with different profiles, different interests, et cetera. So what can we do to personalize a little bit further? Obviously creating content to suit the audience in combination with your business goals. So we don't wanna just run off merrily and create all sorts of cool content. We need to make sure it matches the business goals and also ties in with the profile of the people that you're talking to. And then tailor the newsletter to better suit the recipients. And there are a few ways that we can go about doing this. So imagery and words is, is obviously the two tools that you have available to you. And we can use those in a whole range of different ways within Eloqua. So let's jump in. I want to show you an example, um, kind of a mock-up, I suppose, of what that might look like. So on the left, we've got an email. And that email typically will have a hero image of some sort. There'll be maybe an introduction of some sort. And then there'll be multiple articles. But you can see here in this example, you may not have six different articles. But if you've got six different pieces of content, what we could do is in fact tailor who gets to see what. So maybe the first two at the very top, these could in fact be dynamic content. You, you could use imagery to support the person's industry, their course of study, if it's for a university. Maybe it's a, a primary interest they've expressed in relation to a product or service, whatever it is. You could just alter that imagery to ever so subtly uh, reinforce that particular point. Then the introduction. So you might have an introduction at the beginning of your newsletter, sort of setting the scene as to what's being covered in the newsletter below. You know, maybe that could also be dynamic content, again, driven by a whole range of different variables. Then as we start to move through, maybe you determine that the primary article, so article A, the number one article, everybody gets to see that. It's not dynamic content, it's static, and that's what everybody gets to see. However, once you get into articles B and C, maybe these ones are only seen by customers or existing students or, or members. So these are people who have an existing relationship with you. And once you know that that's who's going to see those articles, then your copywriters can write it in such a way that acknowledges that the people who are reading these pages are known to you as an organization. So we don't use vague terms, et cetera. We, we can be quite specific because these are customers who are looking at this. These are customers, students, members, et cetera, that are looking at this information. Then perhaps D and E, so the next two articles, these are written and directed to prospective customers, future students, or prospective members. This, again, the language and the way that you use or write the copy can differ uh, because you know that the people reading it are not currently customers of your organization. And then finally, maybe the last article is those who are using, a, you know, the customers who are maybe using just a specific product or service. I, I mocked this up based actually on an email we did recently because we pretty much followed that exact same format that you can see in front of you. And some of you will receive our uh, notification for important updates to Eloqua, which we do roughly once a quarter. And, in, and literally we followed that exact same pattern. For us, that last one, Article F, 
was we had a range of clients, many of you probably on the call with us today, uh, who told us that you use Zoom. So Zoom is the primary platform that you use from a marketing point of view. So we had an update in relation to that, but I thought for our customers who are using GoToWebinar or WebEx, they probably really couldn't care less or it's of no interest to them. So why do they need to see it, right? So we were able to use some dynamic content to in fact display that last article just to those people who had told us previously that they use Zoom. So a little bit more personalized uh, in the way that that uh, information gets pre presented. So you may look at this and think, well, you do that's adding quite a bit more work to my newsletter. Yeah, look, sorry to break it to you, and it, it probably is, but the result that you're going to get, hopefully, and that's the thing you need to measure out of, the, out of the back end of this, and this is why we do it. We do it because we have measured it and we know we get better results, is through that level of personalization. Hopefully, that's a bit of a tangible tip to help you think about one approach uh, for your newsletter. And honestly, it's not that much more work. Uh, if you need some tips or have some questions, let me know and I can help you through that. So the other way that we've often used hyper-personalization is around events. And um, it starts often from a segmentation point of view and looking very carefully at the segment and, and playing with filters to kind of get the segment to the, the number and the audience that we want. But it's actually looking at the data, the actual contact data that really drives the next part of that whole exercise. And so what we tend to do then is look for common data points. Again, so I'm looking for a bulk of people who might have similar job categories or a bulk of people who might be of similar industries, et cetera. And so if I see once I've created the segment and the audience that we have a disproportionate number of people within financial services, then that kind of tells me that, you know what, it's probably worthwhile creating some dynamic content to speak more about that particular industry and the topic that we're going to cover and its impact in that particular industry. Job level, et cetera, is another big one. Um, geography as well can sometimes very subtly play a role in that as well. And geographically, maybe it's just imagery that you use. If it's a webinar, obviously, it's the people are going to be everywhere. Uh, however, if it's happening in George Street in Sydney or Collins Street in Melbourne, then you know, maybe stick to stay away from that one. Current products or services was the other point. And so the point here being that uh, if the topic of your event speaks potentially to a particular product or service that you have, then again, maybe some dynamic content. And keeping in mind with dynamic content, as you look at the invitation, it could be that the, the opening paragraph is dynamic content. Obviously, the agenda for the actual meeting is not going to change based on who the people are. They're all coming to one meeting. But the fact is that different people in your audience may, in fact, be interested in different areas or parts of that agenda. So then you can use dynamic content to expand on particular points based on what you know about those particular people. So all of those things can help. Then I would suggest using dynamic content to play with a few different bits and pieces like as follows. Keeping in mind, you can play with dynamic content for your subject line. So the subject line is something that, that clearly is that key piece of data that's going to get people to open your email or to ignore the email. Now, if we can use a subject line that we know, for example, say in our world, that's going to resonate potentially, say, with a C-level executive, CMO, CIO, CEO, et cetera, but the subject line for perhaps a marketing manager is going to be different. You know, different... Um, different objectives, different expectations, et cetera, those sorts of things. So using different words to attract the right sort of person. Imagery is a powerful one. As I said, imagery is super easy uh, to use from a dynamic content point of view. And signatures, et cetera, playing with opening paragraphs, as I talked about there just a moment ago. Uh, the personalization that you've got from a signature point of view is obviously a big one. So um, you've got the ability to do that. If you've not done that before, it really does make a difference. So um, have a think about that one as well. All right, there, how are we doing on chat? Okay, so I can see a chat there in relation to someone's using a contact washing machine, um, just trying to automate the data cleansing process. And that's, yeah, that's a, a, great, uh, a great tip. That one, is, as I said, we've got a few clients who have a number of different programs set up. So they're using the contact washing machine as well as the programs 
to constantly cycle through and, and bring people through the different data scrubbing processes. Are there any other questions at that point? I think we're looking pretty good. Here we go. Okay, so from Anna, is it okay to copy a pick list and then amend a copy? Yeah, that's absolutely fine, Anna. The copying of a pick list is fine because you're not impacting the original uh, and it, that yeah, that's not gonna make any change. So that can be a nice little time saver. So that's a good way to go. And then, okay, then the other one was answered. All right, cool. Let's move on to the next bit, which was quickly just a recap of the things we covered last month, looking at those changes that have happened to Eloqua with the February release. As I mentioned there a moment ago, we do an update email, usually once a quarter, maybe twice a quarter, depending on information that we have. But if you're not subscribed to our important Eloqua updates uh, service, you should go ahead and subscribe now. You can scan that QR code on the screen and uh, make that happen. But uh, just to quickly recap, the split decision step on the canvas, I've started playing with that one. I haven't used it in a campaign yet, but I keep trying to think of different ways to play with it. Um, the most common one people seem to like is the notion of doing sort of semi-automatic A-B testing. Uh, it's also going to be really helpful though for brand new clients moving into Eloqua for the first time, where we have to do all sorts of testing and uh, IP warming and those sorts of things. It'll certainly save time there as well. The intelligent form spam prevention. So again, you may have noticed under the settings area of your form, the little switch to turn on the form spam area. Our advice to you is if you're using that form on an Eloqua landing page, then go ahead and turn it on. Don't, uh, don't delay. If the form is being reposted from your website though, there will be some HTML updates that will need to be done. And our support team can help you with that process but there'll uh, need to be a little bit of work between your web developers and your Eloqua team uh, to, in order to turn that feature on. I did see some comments in top liners the other day by someone who's clearly a little bit more gifted than I am in from a developer point of view. They had been doing some kind of robust testing on this Eloqua feature independently within their organization. Um, and the general feedback was they felt it was much better and much more robust than Capture, uh, which some of you may use on different forms. So it's something for you to consider uh, and think about. It's active and available for everybody. Uh, it's just a matter of you choosing to turn it on uh, form by form. Okay. Uh, updates in response to Apple Mail privacy changes. So uh, what you've got now is the ability to see that information in Insight and uh, you'll see information and different columns that have been added and, and variables. We'll have some more information uh, towards the end of this month in relation to that, but you will find some details on past blog posts on our site as well. The other one is the blind form submit uh, URL. So that one, I believe you need to request to be turned on, but the advice is to definitely turn it on. But again, optional. Uh, basically what that's doing is making sure that if you are using blind form submits, in that process, Eloqua will take information from a contact and move it into the form for you, and it does it through the URL. In the past, that information could have been potentially hacked and, and stolen from URLs by untoward individuals, but the, uh, the blind form submit shortening eliminates that. So there's no way now for that to be that data to be stolen, uh, which is good. And then for our Zoom customers, as I said, they're really just the only update is there's no update at the moment. And of course, the SMS enhancement from Eloqua, which are quite extensive, that product is, is beefing up, which is great. It's still under what we call controlled availability. So you do need to speak to us or to your Oracle representative, and we can request admission to that uh, beta release uh, of the program or it's, yeah, it's it's more than beta, It's but it just, uh, you need to request to have a play with it essentially. It is an add-on and does come at an extra cost, of course, and then there's the cost of obviously some of the SMSs, uh, which we all know, but that's so minimal, it's kind of negligible. So I thought we got a little bit of time there. I'll just have a quick look at the Q&A and see if there's any particular questions. So let me just quickly show you two things there in relation to the form. So if I have a look here, at the March user group form. So this is the form that you use to register to join us today. Uh, if we have a look under the third tab, which is your settings area, right here, you'll see spam protection. And you'll notice we have it turned on. That's all I need to do. 
uh, is simply turn it on. A uh, little bit of information there, and you go off to the help center. It'll tell you a bit more about it, etc. But uh, but yeah, it's really quite simple. Uh, you just turn it on, and as long as the form is then sitting directly on an Eloqua landing page. So if we have a look at dependencies, we can see where it's being used. So here it is. So if I click on open, it'll take me directly to the landing page where that form is being used. And it's all simple and it's nice and easy. But as I said, if you're using a form on your website and you're reposting into uh, Eloqua, then that's a different issue. There's a little bit of HTML work that needs to be done. So, uh, so just be aware of that. And if you need some assistance, of course, please reach out. Uh, we can help you with that at any time. Now, the other one to look at was on the campaign canvas, which was the new split audience. So audience split, as it's called. So basically what you might do, for example, is have your audience come in. And at that very point, you may then decide to split the audience in two directions. And it's basically, you've got complete control over the percentages, whichever percentage you want. And you may send people, if you're wanting to test two different types of emails, and then to look at the general performance afterwards, then you can do that. Just make sure you name them something that makes crystal clear sense so you know what you're doing, or so you know what the data is telling you at the end of the exercise. But that's it, that's, a, that's the configuration right there. Now you don't have any control over who goes down which direction, who goes down the yes and who goes down the no. Eloqua makes that decision, um, but it does split the audience for you. So that's audience split, uh, which everybody should have uh, on their instance of Eloqua as of today. All right, people, I think we're, um, I think we're pretty much at the end. So do we have any other questions? We're, what are we, slightly early today, which is a miracle. Okay, folks, thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. Next month, we'll be focusing on the email editor and the landing page design editors, giving you a little bit of a deep dive and uh, revisit those and, and get you up to speed on everything that's happening within those. So we'll send some details to you uh, in a couple of weeks. Have a wonderful day. Thanks so much for joining us. Stay dry and to all the women on the line, happy International Women's Day. And to the boys on the line, make sure you take the girls out for a cup of coffee or a lunch or something today. And uh, we'll see everybody next month. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye.